This video is brought to you by Surfshark. Safety and security are super important, and you can protect yourself online with Surfshark. Get 83% off and three months for free through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. On the 11th of March 2011, the seabed off the eastern coast of Japan began to move. The time was 2.46 p.m. The earthquake, with its hypocenter approximately 29 kilometers below the surface of the water, was bound to become the strongest in Japanese history and the fourth strongest anywhere in the world since 1900. But this was just the start. The massive tsunami, now barreling towards Japan, was about to cause devastation that would see over 15,000 people lose their lives and the nearby Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station inching towards unimaginable disaster. The most serious nuclear accident since Chernobyl was about to unfold. The Fukushima nuclear power station covers an area measuring 3.5 square kilometers, and it's close to the towns of Akuma and Futaba on the eastern coast of the Japanese mainland. Construction began in 1969, and it was formally opened in 1970. The plant is composed of six boiling water nuclear reactors producing 4.7 gigawatts of energy, placing Fukushima in the top 15 largest nuclear power stations in the world. These reactors were opened one at a time, but by 1979, all six were operational. As the investigation after the accident got underway, questions began to be asked over several aspects of the power station, not least the decision to have so many nuclear reactors so close to one another right on the coast. It's easy, of course, to look back in hindsight, but generally speaking, before the accident, it was considered well run and well maintained. Situated on the seafront, protected by a small seawall and on a raised bluff, the power station's location now seems like a pretty terrible choice, as does the decision to lower the overall height of the bluff from 35 meters to just 10 meters, which would lower the cost of seawater pumping and also allow the reactors to be built on more solid bedrock, which in theory would help to mitigate the threat of earthquakes. Just to give you an idea of how prevalent earthquakes are in this part of the world, Japan receives roughly 1,500 tremors each year. And while the earthquake that led to the mayhem on the 11th of March 2011 was bigger than anything ever seen, tragic earthquakes are very much a part of Japanese history. In 1923, the Great Kanto earthquake killed 142,800 people and devastated the nation's capital of Tokyo. But this also means that the nation has developed some of the best earthquake prevention methods anywhere in the world. It's estimated that 87% of buildings in Tokyo can withstand earthquakes. Large buildings are built with deeper than normal foundations, and many come with inflated rubber or liquid filled bases, which act as shock absorbers, allowing the base to move semi independently from the rest of the building. The earthquake that shook the seabed on the 11th of March 2011 measured 9 on the Richter scale. This is the category of the largest earthquakes in history. What shook Sumatra in December 2004, killing over 200,000 people around the Indian Ocean, was slightly more powerful than what struck Japan in 2011. 0.1 more on the Richter scale, to be exact. There is some debate over whether a Category 10 is even actually possible, as this would equate to roughly 56.6 trillion kilograms of TNT and would likely cause devastation on an apocalyptic level. So, for all of our sake, let's hope that we never see a 10. The wave that stormed towards the Japanese mainland is reported to have measured up to 40.5 meters at its highest point, roughly the height of a 13-story building, and traveled at speeds of 700 kilometers an hour, 435 miles per hour. Residents in the coastal areas had only between 8 and 10 minutes warning, and for many, this simply wasn't enough. At the Fukushima power station, as per protocol, the reactors went into automatic shutdown as a result of the initial earthquake, but a disastrous set of circumstances had already been set in motion. With the reactors shutting down, and with widespread electrical grid problems, power within the power station failed, which is a bit of a paradoxical situation, if there ever was one. This power failure led to the backup generators starting which were vital to pump cooling liquid around the reactors. For the moment, the power station was safe, but as the first wave appeared on the horizon, things were about to go from bad to nuclear meltdown kind of bad. 
The water powered over the seawall, flooding the lower sections of reactors 1 through 4. Within minutes, the backup generators also began to fail, and the critical cooling liquid ceased circulating within the reactors. What came next was a 7 on the international nuclear event scale. And yes, you probably guessed it, the scale only goes up to 7. This had only occurred once before, on the 26th of April 1986, with the catastrophe at Chernobyl. And despite the best efforts of the staff at the plant, three of the reactors, 1, 2, and 3, went into meltdown, and three hydrogen and explosions left Fukushima a wreckage. In the coming days, the evacuation zone was repeatedly pushed further and further back until it stood at 20 kilometers, leading to 154,000 people being ordered to leave their homes. Radiation was released into the atmosphere, but also huge amounts seeped into the waters off the coast. There were mass reports that Tokyo was seeing levels of radiation 22 times higher than what was safe in the days after the accident, but these proved to be false. The days following the accident saw levels in Tokyo increase, but only to about that of twice a standard X-ray. Now, before we move on to the cleanup that happened in the wake of the Fukushima meltdown, let's have a quick word from today's video sponsor, Surfshark. Now, do use the internet. Well, of course you do. You're on it right now unless you downloaded this before or something, but bear with me. Do you have personal information that you'd rather remain personal? Well, who doesn't? Let me tell you something, the internet is a weird place. There are people out there who want to ruin your day, they want to take your details, steal your identity, which can be a real pain in the ass. Surfshark has something called Hacklock. This searches database for your passwords, which sounds like a bad thing, but it's not. Surfshark are the good guys. They let you know if your password has been leaked out there, so you can change that password on other websites and keep them safe. And once you're back in that warm comfort of safety, maybe you're like, mm, let's watch some Netflix. I want to watch The Hobbit. But watch this. The Hobbit is only available in the UK and you live in the United States. That's terrible. But Surfshark will fix that right up. Boom. Sneaky. Turn on Surfshark VPN. Now you're in the UK through the magic of technology and you can watch The Hobbit as much as you want. Then you're like, oh, The Hobbit was great. I want to go to New Zealand. I'm telling such a story. I want to go see those Hobbit houses. But what's this? The prices for flights keep going up when I keep going back to the website. Well, open up an incognito browser, flip on your VPN, and you might find those flights are actually cheaper because they don't think you've been to the site many times before. And so they've They've jacked up the price. A VPN stops that from happening. Surfshark is also totally unlimited, so you can download as much as you want. So avoid your own online disaster and get 83% off and three months for free through the link in the description below or use the code MEGA. And let's get back to Japan, where you can go with Surfshark VPN, by the way. The immediate weeks after the nuclear accident were chaotic, as the Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, who was responsible for the power plant, battled to bring the disaster under control. The number of separate challenges facing the company was vast. First and foremost, radiation leaking out of the power station needed to be brought under control. Along with that, the huge amount of contaminated water accumulating in the base of the reactors would also have to be carefully disposed of. Then we come to the dizzying dilemma what the hell to do with four badly damaged nuclear reactors. These are not buildings where you simply slap a padlock on and blow it up at a later date. If you need a perfect example of this, well, the Chernobyl disaster happened almost 35 years ago, and they are still nowhere near completing the cleanup. If the reactors at the Fukushima power plant were to be decommissioned, this was a process that would take decades. But at least they had a rough idea of how this would be done. Away from the power station, TEPCO was faced with perhaps an even greater challenge. How can the area within the 20 kilometer radius exclusion zone be made safe once again? Soil, trees, houses, roads, everything had to be cleaned or moved to another location before inhabitants were allowed back. This was a disaster that would eventually lead to the largest cleanup operation in history, not to mention the costliest. In the days following the accident, work began removing the debris that lay strewn throughout the site. This was done using remote-controlled heavy lifting equipment that cleared the debris, which was then placed into specialized containers that were kept on site until it could all be disposed of properly. The most pressing concern was the radiation still leaking out of the reactors. On reactor 2, they found a 20-centimeter crack towards the base. TEPCO first tried to block it by ejecting fresh concrete, polymeric water absorbent, sawdust, and shredded newspapers into the crack, which did little to stem the flow. After further examinations, they switched to sodium silicate on April the 5th, and by the following day, the leak had finally been plugged. 
Two weeks later, a clear-ish plan was put into place of how TEPCO would be approaching the cleanup operation. This included 1. A cold shutdown in about 6 to 9 months, when the coolant system is at an atmospheric pressure and a temperature below 93 Celsius. 2. Restoring stable cooling to the reactors and spent fuel pools in about 3 months. 3. Putting special covers over units 1, 3, and 4. 4. Installing additional storage containers for the radioactive water gathering in the turbine basements and outside trenches. 5. Using radio-controlled equipment to clean up the site. 6. Using silt fences to limit ocean contamination. In terms of to-do lists, this was monumental, and it needed to be done carefully, but also as quickly as possible. The reactors remained in a delicate state, and would be until they were sufficiently cooled. Cooling liquid was injected into the battered reactors, but began seeping out of the bottom, further expanding the pool of contaminated water. Normally, excess water can be pumped into a holding tank known as a condenser, but the amount was far too much. The Japanese initially requested the use of a Russian floating water decontamination plant called the Landish, but it quickly became clear that the Russians were in no hurry to aid Japan without tacking on plenty of conditions. The negotiations eventually broke down, and the Japanese began looking for alternatives. The funny thing about this is, while the land dish was built by Russia, it was primarily funded by Japan. I suppose if anything, it shows you who your real friends are. The amount of contaminated water became such a problem that on the 5th of April, TEPCO decided to discharge 11,500 tons of what they considered to be the least contaminated water into the sea. At the same time, additional water storage tanks began arriving and were quickly filled. Much of this contaminated water is still present at Fukushima, with over 1.2 million tons believed to remain on the site. One of the most intriguing additions at Fukushima has been the so-called ice wall, measuring 1.5 kilometers long and situated 30 meters below the surface. Designed to prevent groundwater, running from nearby mountains from entering the site area, the wall isn't really a wall at all, but rather a series of pipes that now encircle the power plant. Coolant, set at minus 33 Celsius, is pumped through the pipes, which in turn freezes the ground around it, hence the ice wall. This is a technique that has been around for nearly 150 years, first used to help construct mine shafts, but few, if any, can match the $300 million barricade built by the Japanese. Fabric covers were installed over the reactors by the end of 2011. You might be thinking, well, Simon, what good is fabric going to do? But this sturdy polyester fabric, along with specialized filters, was able to stem much of the radioactive substances from escaping. A cold shutdown was finally achieved on the 11th of December 2011, making further meltdowns impossible. By this point, it had already been announced that reactors 1 through 4 would be decommissioned, a process that authorities believed could take as long as 30 years. The fate of reactors 5 and 6 are still up in the air, but most agree that they will be decommissioned too. But if you're thinking that things are over, well, think again. Work has progressed at an agonizingly slow pace ever since. As you probably would expect at the site of a nuclear disaster. In August 2013, officials made the extraordinary announcement that 300 tons of radioactive water was leaking out into the Pacific Ocean every single day. It was at this point that the Japanese government decided to step in and play a larger role in the cleanup operation. It wasn't until 2019 that the nuclear fuel rods from Reactor 3 began to be removed, a process that is expected to last for two years. To do this, a large dome-shaped metal cover had to be constructed over the reactor which was finished in February 2018. For reactors 1 and 2, which are both in a much more delicate state, this process is not expected to even start until 2023. There were countless fears raised in the aftermath of the disaster at Fukushima, with one being the contamination of land around the power plants, which in turn could lead to contaminated crops and water sources. If the cleanup operation within the power station is impressive, what has been happening in the surrounding area is perhaps even more so. In the years after the disaster, as many as 70,000 people removed topsoil, tree branches, and even grass from around the Fukushima plant. Quite simply, they were trying to cleanse the entire area of any potential contamination, a process believed to cost in the region of 2.9 trillion yen, which is about $27 billion, and will eventually cover 14 million cubic meters of soil by 2021. But what do you do with all the contaminated soil? Well, in truth, there's not a whole lot that can be done. The soil cannot be completely cleaned, so instead it is being held in temporary containers until a suitable site can be found somewhere in Japan to store it. Unsurprisingly, this is proving hard to come by, with countless areas rejecting the chance to take in the contaminated soil. But even when they do find somewhere, this soil is not expected to be completely safe for at least three decades and probably much longer.
Considering the disaster took place nearly a decade ago, it's shocking to think that this cleanup operation probably hasn't even hit its midway point. Yes, the immediate danger has rescinded with the reactors put into a cold shutdown state, but this will be a true marathon of an operation. So where are we right now in 2020? Well, not very far, to be perfectly honest. They've only just started removing fuel rods from Reactor 3, which is by far the easiest of three to address. Reactor 1 is still covered by dangerous rubble and represents a foreboding challenge for the future. Reactor 2 is in a slightly better situation, but not by much. Nobody quite knows how much this will all eventually cost. The initial estimate after the accident of 1 trillion yen, 13 billion dollars, now sounds like a bit of a joke. The most recent estimate, in 2018, now puts the figure at 21.5 trillion yen, or 187 billion dollars. The water remains a huge problem. As of 2020, over a million tons of contaminated water is still being kept on site. But the tanks are quickly approaching capacity. With 120 tons added per day, there has been a steadily increasing belief that eventually this water will be released into the Pacific Ocean. As you might imagine, environmental organizations have reacted with fury to this plan, but it's not immediately clear whether a viable alternative can be found. But people are returning to the area, with as many as 122,000 inhabitants going back to the homes that they were frantically evacuating from in 2011. But things are not the same. Many of the towns require serious reconstruction, with a ghostly aura still hanging in the air. For many, it has come down to the generous financial initiatives and the prospect of brand new homes. But it will be years, perhaps even decades, until this area begins to feel normal again. The shadow hanging over this nuclear power plant is not going to go away anytime soon. With the cleanup operation plodding painstakingly on and the slow reconstruction of the towns and lives completely upended by the events of the 11th of March 2011, the name Fukushima is one we will be hearing for some time to come. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to check out our fantastic sponsor Surfshark, linked to below. And thank you for watching.